observed is to study the experimental behavior in the classical limit, that is the limit where everyone agrees that quantum mechanics, at least the quantum mechanics are basically reduced to those classical mechanics. From those, that experimental behavior, you try to derive enough about the, um, uh, the, the microscopic description, not the whole microscopic description, but enough to make confident quantum mechanical predictions. That's a uh, path that uh, has been followed in this area over the last few decades and actually seems to have um, worked reasonably well. <laughs> so what are we talking about here? What kind of uh, thing are we talking about? This, uh, uh, this is a so-called, uh, well, it used to be called, uh, in the old days it was called a radio frequency squid. Um, squid standing for superconducting quantum interference device. Um, nowadays, um, because of the, uh, the development of the field of quantum information, it's usually called a flux cubic. Um, and it may, in fact, this, this object may turn out eventually to be an important ingredient in a quantum computer. But that's, that's uh, in some sense, uh, not very remote. Um, basically, it's a bit of a metal, um, and it can actually happen in certain ways. The actual action um, takes place uh, in this region here, which is blown up um, here. And if you look at the scale, you can see that this is just about this with the data type. Barely, but uh, if you have good eyesight, you should be able to see it. Um, now, why is this an uh, interesting and suitable um, system to do experiments to see if quantum mechanics is still valid at the macroscopic level? Well, let's just digress for a moment to say just a few words about the physics of superconductivity. Um, we know that elementary particles, um, neutrons, electrons, and other protons, come in two types, depending on whether their spin, their intrinsic uh, rotational motion, is even or odd in a certain set of units, uh, h bar, uh, x constant and 2 bar. If the spin is integral, whether it's 0, 1, or 2, okay, they're called bosons and they're behaving in way. If it, the spin is half integral, they're called fermions and they're behaving in different Now, um, fermions are pretty boring, for generally speaking, mm -hmm. because um, what happens is they tend to, uh, uh, fermions are extremely xenophobic. They will not tolerate having more than one particle per state. And therefore, the lowest energy states available are all occupied each by one fermion up to a certain limiting energy, called the Fermi energy, and there's a certain amount of thermal steering around that. But basically, most of the fermions involved are just sitting in this Fermi C, so called, and they're not doing anything particularly interesting. Bosons are much more spectacular. Bosons are extremely gregarious. They love to have more than one part of the same state. They love so much, in fact, that below a certain temperature, uh, they will, you'll find um, a non-zero fraction of all the particles, a macroscopic number of particles, in a single one time system. That's called the, the Bose concept. And incidentally, there's very interesting experiments in which uh, something see the Bose condensate directly in a time of gas in the last 50 years or so. Now, the electrons of metals have spin up off. Therefore, they're fluid. And so at first sight, we think they're not behaving this very uninteresting work. However, it turns out, if you put together an even number of fermions, then it turns out it has to have an integral split of 0, 1, or 2. So it becomes a boson, in this perspective. For example, the helium at 4 atom, which we usually think of as a boson, is actually composed of two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. Anyway, if you've got this, this compound uh, you can undergo a boson condensation. So you might think at first sight, but I think it went something like this that um, you get two electrons coming together, um, uh, forming a tightly bound uh, sort of molecule here, and these molecules then undergo uh, Bose condensation. And it's possible that is the right um, picture of some of the more recently discovered superconductors, like the high-temperature superconductors, but uh, at least as regards the old-fashioned superconductors, it's almost certainly not right. Rather what happens is that indeed the two electrons do form a sort of, if you like, molecule, but the, the size of that molecule is huge compared to the average distance between the electrons. So between these two, which are forming some sense of molecule, you have any number of other uh, electrons which all uh, forming their own molecules. Um, people sometimes compare this to a kind of modern dance in which my emotion may be strongly correlated with those of my partner, but she's way across the room, and between us there are any number of other couples all forming their own correlations and doing their own thing. The very strongly collective phenomenon. Now, the simplest theory of superconductivity, which is the BCS theory, uh, 
after my colleagues got in Peter and Fever at the University of Illinois, and they came up with this theory in the late 50s. Um, uh, these so-called these large Q starting molecules, if you like, the dielectric molecules, the pupa pairs, once they're formed, they must automatically undergo those conversation. And having undergone that conversation, conversation, they must all do exactly the same thing at the same time. And that's also true, not just in equilibrium, but also in a moment. Now let's think about a rather simple um, uh, setup. Suppose I had a simple superconducting wing um, through which I thread a magnetic flux. Right. Turns out, there's a, uh, you have to take some trust, I'm afraid, so there's a quantization condition for a particle of charge to E plus the group of papers, which says that the uh, certain property, K, the circulation around the E, has to be. So some fundamental constants times some integer n minus the flux in the sort of total flux quantity. And the energy on one state is proportional to k squared. Suppose first that the flux is zero, that's wrong more, because then the ground state is unique, and you must, uh, the, the lowest energy state must correspond to n equal zero. So all pairs are regressed, and this is not particularly interesting for our purposes. A much more interesting case is where the flux is half of, exactly half of the flux quantity. In that case, the ground state is doubly degenerate. That means there are two ground states which have exactly the same energy. You can see if you sit, put n equals zero in here, you have a minus pi over pi zero, and squared, you get pi over pi, pi zero squared. But if you put n equals one, you get minus pi over pi zero, you square it again, the same thing. So these two states have exactly the same energy. So either, at least at a classical level, either all, all the pairs rotate uh, anticlockwise or they all rotate clockwise. Um, you might say, well, couldn't you have half the electrons, or, or half the pairs rotating clockwise, and the other half giving anticlockwise? And the answer is no, you can't. Uh, it turns out that that state is very strongly forbidden by energetic considerations. So, so that will not occur. Um, okay. It, and it turns out that particular uh, setup in by itself is not, not um, for various reasons, not particularly good for our purposes, but it's just pretty lovely. It's, then some put in a so-called Josephson junction. And you can then think of the Josephson junction as like a, uh, a little gate, which will allow Cooper pairs through, but with increased energy. And under those conditions, it turns out, that you can actually get transitions between clockwise and anticlockwise state. So now you have the following question. Whenever we look at the, the system, this is an experiment effect, whenever we look at the system, we always find either this state, that Counterclockwise state or the clockwise state. And these are different by a sort of reasonably macroscopic current, something like a microwave. What, what about the state of the system when we're not looking at it? Could it be that it actually uh, has, it can occur in a quantum superposition of these two macroscopically different states? Macroscopically, by the way, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, simply means at the everyday level. So these states are pretty much different at the everyday level of cluster. So we can actually examine that question. And um, the first evidence that it could indeed tolerate a state of this kind was spectroscopic, uh, done in 2000 in two different places. Uh, you can actually measure the energy splitting uh, between, as a function of the, the energies of the various states of the system as a function of the external applied and the negative products. And if you believe that at all times the system is either in the state or in this, then you get a pick dash mark. If you believe that it's in a quantum superposition, then you get a phenomenon which somebody may recognize a level of repulsion, and the, the energy levels follow the reference here. And you can actually tell which of these is right by doing a spectroscopic experiment. Sure enough, it came out in favor of the good numbers. So it does look as if that uh, the system is behaving in this kind of way. A much more spectacular set of experiments have been conducted more recently, real-time oscillations. For those of you who know are familiar with the ammonia molecule, these are rather like the the experiment, or uh, thought experiment, in which you start the ammonia molecule, the, the ammonia molecule, and start on one side as it goes to the And I'll just show you, uh, not my, uh, I won't try to talk the details of this experiment, but I haven't done it before you know, but In fact, um, those um, experiments have been done, um, experiments of this type have been done uh, in various, various uh, laboratories over the last 10 years or so. 
And that makes a pretty spectacular result. Not just do you get oscillations, you get strongly coherent, that is, not strongly dead oscillations. Um, generally speaking, in quantum mechanics, if you have this kind of oscillation, it'll get blurred out in the, after a few cycles. And if you'd asked me in, in say, 1999 to predict uh, how, how many cycles you'd be able to see by the year 2011, I'd have probably said, maybe like you see two or three. In fact, we wouldn't now see, and this is out of date, we would now see up to 500 you know, oscillations around that. It's very spectacular. So everything does appear to be consistent with the idea that even when you're talking about two states, which are really pretty macroscopically distinct, pretty much distinct at the everyday level, that um, everything is consistent with, with um, them uh, be, uh, existing in quantum superpositions of these two states. In other words, it is not true any more than it's true at the level of the atom. But one state or the other is definitely real.